I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We are today going to be talking about uh, the article, um, but we're going to do it in a restorative justice circle kind of way, a virtual restorative, modified restorative justice circle. So how many people are, know about restorative justice circles, are aware of them, or have participated? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, the way you, <laughs> the way you do restorative justice circles, uh, I'm just going to do a brief uh, overview. The important piece is the talking piece. And this, today we're using a seashell. And the way we're gonna do this is I'm going to say, you're gonna to have to use your imagination. But when I finish talking, only time you can talk is if you have uh, the seashell in your hand or not in your hand, but you're the person who is responsible for um, talking and no one else can talk. So when I'm finished talking, I'm going to say, I'm gonna call the next person's name, Mary. No, I'm sorry, I'm gonna call the next person's name to my right on my screen. Are we all seeing the same screen? Not. No. Okay, well, I'm going to call the person's name on my right, who is Barbara Holt in my screen. And I'm going to say, Barbara, I'm passing the talking piece to you. And you're going to say, got it. And then you are going to be able to share what you have to say. And then she, when she's finished talking, she's going to say, I'm, talk, I'm passing the talking piece to the person on my right. Always go right on your screen, go right. Let's see if this is gonna work. We're gonna try it out. Um, so uh, restorative justice talking circles are about speaking your own truth. They're not about who said what, they said, whatever. It's about speaking your story, giving your story, your interpretation of something. Um, it's also about values. And so we are going to start in a few minutes and we're going to, I want you to think about your best friend and the value that you, um, what you value in that person. Just one word. And once we have everybody's word, we're going to, I'm gonna ask you, can we agree to speak um, in this conversation just using these values? All right. Um, and as we go along, I'm going to talk to you about my story, what I bring to the table, what my, what's in my toolbox, and I'm going to ask you about what's in your toolbox. And we're going to discuss the paper along the way. So we're going to start uh, in the restorative justice way. First by, um, I'm going to tell a story. Short, quick story. There's six blind men and they've never seen an elephant. An elephant comes to town and they get somebody to come and see, take them to the elephant. They get to the elephant and the first blind man says, he touches the trunk of the elephant. And he says, oh, a nice thick fat rope. An elephant is a rope. The second blind man touches the tusk and says, Oh, an elephant is like a spear. The third blind man touches the ear of the elephant and says, an elephant is like a fan. The fourth blind man touches the leg and says, an elephant is like a tree trunk. The fifth blind man touches the side of the elephant and says, the elephant is like a wall, a sturdy wall. The sixth blind man touches the tail and says, oh, an elephant is like a snake. Each person's experienced the elephant, but each person has a different experience. They walk away knowing that each of them was right, and they argue all the way back home about what an elephant is. This paper really is a, an opportunity to look from somebody else's perspective. I found that there was a gap in sustainability literature and discourse related to poor marginalized communities in the United States, actually across the world, but especially since this paper is just focusing on the United States. 
So let's first, let's go next to values. What value do you value in your friend? Barbara Holt, I'm passing you the talking piece. Got it. I value. One word. Love, love, not romantic love, but. Okay. Love. Now you, you have to pack, you know, Pretend you're passing oh, the talking to the person on your right, um, the right of your screen. I'm passing it to Jennifer. All right. I am uh, bringing the word of empathy. And I will pass, Barbara's actually to my right, so uh, I will pass double to the right to Nalini. Got it? <laughs> Fairness. I will pass that to my right. It's Mary. Oh. Got it. I, my word is integrity. Integrity. Yes. I will pass it to my right. Well, that's you, that's you, Muriel. Jeannie. Yes. Okay. My word uh, was also empathy. So I'll stay with empathy. And mom's word what is, it, communication? is communication. Okay. And we will pass it to, on here it says Nalini. Okay. Nalini spoke already, so choose someone else. Go uh, two more over. <laughs> Let's see. Shirley Macklin. Compassion. <laughs> My word is kindness. Who are you passing it to? To the right. That's mom. <laughs> well, it shows up as. Stick your finger on the person if you don't know the name, then we'll get let's it go later. With, let's go with Michael. Hi, I'm Michael from the SFIS Alumni Board. Uh, my word was also kindness. <laughs> Okay. Pass the talking piece. Um, I can't see who. See if you can stick your finger on the, the, the person. Or use your arrow to go to light up the people's name or okay. the face. How about. Uh, Is it Farah? Yes. Farrah. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, I, my word is um, self-reflection or introspection. Pass the talking piece. And I am trying to find somebody who has not spoken yet because I passed to uh, Adams. Oh yeah, sorry. Ah, yeah. <laughs> hear it, hear it, Adams. Um, my word would be support. That's the talking piece. Oh, um, to the right, Barbara. Um, okay, she's spoken already. See, see if you can find another one. Jennifer, you went already too, right? <laughs> um, Ryan, Kathy. Leo, Cynthia, Sarah. Ryan. Pastor Ryan. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan, also from the uh, alumni board. Uh, thank you so much, Muriel and Nalini, for doing this today. Uh, my word is openness. Okay. Oh, and so I'm passing to, uh, I will pass. I feel like I can't see everyone. Uh, you can't see everyone? Has Sarah gone? I have not gone, but um, hi. hi, this is Sarah, and hello to Ryan and Michael Hammett, my fellow class of whatever for GTD. Um, <laughs> my word is um, my word is tenacity, and I will pass to. Um, hold on, I'm just scrolling through here. 
did oh no Kathy Kathy Leo Cynthia I'll go with Leo since I'm a Leo <laughs> thanks Sarah um my word would be trustworthiness and I will pass to how about Cynthia Cynthia he took my word <laughs> um so I, I get, oh that's okay um loyalty okay who are you passing it to Dean and Kathy are left I, I, I'll pass to Jean. Hey, Jean. <laughs> Did she do it already? Okay, let's pass. Yeah, I see your name up twice. Okay, Kathy, do we have Kathy? Kathy, are you there? Yeah. What's your word? Um, uh, compassion. Compassion. Okay. Can we all agree that this is, my word is respect. Can we all agree that these values are how we will talk to and conduct this conversation? Yes? Yes. 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 I wanted to start by, um, usually the, a, I told you the stories are told through, you know, throughout the process, but I'm going to insert a little bit about my experience in, in place of these stories how I came to write this article, you know, what is in my toolbox. When I got to um, Arizona State University, the School of Sustainability, I brought with me in my toolbox a degree in, master's degree in organizational leadership and an MBA. I also bought, brought um, the being able to be a facilitator for restorative justice classes or circles, and I taught restorative justice classes and um, criminal justice classes. These things that I brought with me in my toolbox shaped how I was thinking about what my dissertation would look like, what I wanted to study. <clears throat> I also was a CASA, a court appointed special advocate. And um, I learned things through that process and I also worked as a facilitator or a, um, a, what they call, what I'm doing as a facilitator, sometimes it's referred to as a circle keeper with boys being tried as adults in the criminal justice system in Chicago, in the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center and also at the Cook County Jail. My experience with CASA, just a quick story is I had two girls in my care. I, I was supposed to be their advocate and I would go to their houses um, probably once or twice during the month. And every time I got there, they were not available. So I sat outside. First, I sat in my car and waited for them because there were some gentlemen on the porch and I didn't know who they were. And um, so I sat in my car the first time and they invited me to sit on the porch with them. I sat on the porch with them and, you know, they were just talking and laughing. We got kind of got to know each other. But I noticed that people would, on the other, opposite side of the street, they would walk up toward the house and look over. And I caught that this, one of the guys would make the signal and the person would turn around and go back. So finally, finally, it dawned on me <laughs> that something's up with this and that maybe these guys are selling drugs <laughs> and I'm kind of in the way. As my thought process moved on, I thought, oh my God, you know, this is, this is something new. And then I, a, a, a fright crossed over my body. I'm mm -hmm. thinking, oh my God, there could, it, there could be a drive-by. You know, I just went in kind of a panic mode, but I was sitting there calmly. And uh, I, I now I feel like I'm a lookout. So my perspective on coming there, being the, the, the CASA and doing good changed a bit when I felt like, oh, I could be in danger. <clears throat> so, and, but as I was doing my dissertation and gathering information, I started thinking about the guys on the porch. You know, why were they selling drugs? What was, you know, what was their situation? And I will never know, but that's part of my 
my thinking process, uh, the boys that are being tried as adults, what are they, what, I left that situation thinking, how do I, you know, what, I left that situation thinking about kind of comparing them to my sons at the time who were about the same age and thinking about their future versus the, my son's futures. Um, I also, as a CASA, thought about the foster care system because eventually these girls went into foster care and I would visit them uh, when they were at their foster homes. Uh, so all of that kind of helped shape what I was doing. The MBA gave me insight into stocks and how businesses work. And so at one point we did talk about prison stocks and, and how this was a beautiful thing. But the reality is stocks sell across the, the globe for prison stocks. Um, they are also, they lobby very hard to have, um, you know, to have tougher laws and especially here in Arizona where they have uh, tough in, on crime laws um, where you have to do 85% of your time before even being considered to be released. So how all of these, I felt like I had all of these little pieces of a puzzle and how I put them together, how, you know, it was coming together as I wrote this article, these, these stories kept coming in and out and, 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 oh yes, I can do this and I can do this. Um, so at this point in time, let's, let's go back over and since we did a test run, let's find out who you are a little bit and who's in your, what's in your toolbox. So if you can just introduce yourself and, you know, make it 20 seconds. Let's do this fast. So whoever you called on last time, call on again this time so that person knows it's the rhythm going, okay? Barbara Holt, who are you? I'm passing I you the I am that I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, on a scale, and answer one more question, on a scale of one to 10, how did you come to this process? What did you, um, um, you know, how did you feel coming into this process? You didn't know about the restorative justice piece in the circle, but how did you come into, what, what is it that you expected from coming to the circle or coming into this event? I expected to be um, enlightened more about this issue and to be uh, motivated to support the kind of work that Muriel is doing and that others can do as well. Okay. You can just call the person's name that you spoke with. Spoke with. Or that you passed the talking piece to. Here, Jennifer. Can't hear you, Jennifer. Thank you, sorry. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so I, along with the work that I do at ASU, I am a volunteer for the Girl Scouts of Arizona Cactus Pine Council on the social impact team. And so I regularly volunteer under normal circumstances with the Girl Scouts Beyond Bars program that facilitates meetings with um, young women all over the state visiting their mothers that are currently incarcerated in the Perryville uh, facility in Phoenix, West Phoenix. And so um, I am very connected to the women and the girls that I serve. And so I felt I'm really excited to see where this conversation goes. Okay. And I will pass my talking piece to Nalini. Oh, it's me again. Yes, so two things that interested me about Muriel's work was not just on the criminal justice, but why, what happens to the communities around the incarcerated family, especially when they come out? Why is it not a welcoming community? Because 70 over 70% go back to prison again. So that is the puzzle that I was interested in working with Muriel with, but also I work with indigenous and marginalized and vulnerable communities around the world. So there was a dovetailing of this. Okay. Who did you call? 
the, who did you and it is, I think, Michael to my right. So um, I mentioned that I'm on the um, SFIS board and I'm just interested in, in human stories. And that was um, something that throughout my uh, graduate degree that I focused on, I'm drawn to that. And my background was in communications and news media. So I thought this sounded really interesting and I'm really interested in helping the individual and helping society. And so that to me is where this becomes a really rich topic um, for discussion. Okay. And Did I will pass, oh, I, I'm sorry. The talking piece goes to who? Farah. Um, hello, um, again. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I have a, well, I, I might, but I would need more time to think like what special toolkit I could bring um, I am interested for my uh, research, like research goals to understand, like I, I am studying um, the, the idea of concept of smart cities. So, so I'm interested in looking at the city as a unit where different groups live and face different uh, situations. And I know like cities are very, are very not equal uh, place. Um, so I came to this to learn more about how different groups experience the, the prison and like what are some of like those inequalities. So I don't, I'm not sure <laughs> I could think of, of something I could add as everybody else is just like my interest. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I pass again the talking piece to Adams. Oh, hello. Um, I'm Garrett Adams. I am a in-house sub at UIC College Prep. And um, the reason I joined this chat is because the students that attend UIC College Prep, they uh, come from low-income families and um, communities. So this is going to hopefully get a better understanding of um, how things um, work in their communities as far as um, their siblings and family members and stuff like that being in prison and uh, seeing different ways that I could help them out uh, while uh, working at UIC. Oh, and then I'm passing it to Ryan, I believe. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Meyer and I'm uh, based at the Center for Community and Citizen Science at UC Davis up, up here in uh, near Sacramento. And uh, I am also on the SFIS alumni board. So I have a kind of general interest in supporting these great brown bag events. But um, I also, uh, I feel like I have so much to learn about this topic and it's relevant to me because my group is at the early stages of a, of a collaboration that we're really excited about with a, a program called the Insight Garden Program here in California. And they work in a number of prisons around the state uh, building gardens and um, doing a 12 month long curriculum with incarcerated people focused on a variety of topics related to gardening and the environment and, um, and, and healing. Uh, the self and the environment in interesting ways and, and we are going to be trying to build uh, citizen science activities into that curriculum and thinking about ways that that asking questions and collecting data and taking ownership of an investigative process can be a valuable learning process both both during their time in these places but also when they are, are going back into communities where there are such systemic environmental problems um, so it's very early stages there but i feel like there's a lot to learn from this conversation to take into that so thank you thank you who did you talk past talking piece to oh uh, i think it was sarah but she she had to leave so i think she said leo was the one she passed so i'll pass to leo leo Hi, um, so I'm a current PhD student, but I wanted to attend because like someone had mentioned, I think the industry is ripe for change right now. I mean, especially with, um, I wanted to get or learn a little bit more about, um, I think it was, oh man, I can't remember the exact numbers, up to a couple of thousand, I think, 
inmates being released early. I mean, simply because of pandemic reasons. And I just, I find things like that super fascinating because, I mean, I don't know. There's just so much to discuss as to, okay, well, we have all of these nonviolent people. And then, I don't know, there's, there's just like a shed of humanity there where it's like, well, they're nonviolent. Why are we keeping them here? Oh, it's probably just because we want money. So I don't know. Just the business side of it is, is I think, um, super, super crazy. But yeah. Who are you passing talking piece to? Um, I believe it was Cynthia. Yes, thank you. So um, in pursuing my um, graduate degree in theology, I became from aware of um, the talking circles. So my interest is in um, seeing how it works. <laughs> so, and I'm supporting my friend. Okay. And who are you passing it to? I'm passing it to um, the, I'm passing it to Kathy. Hi, sorry, I was taking me a minute to unmute. Um, I, I wanted to attend because in the work I do now, a lot of kids are dually involved. They're both DCFS kids and kids who got in trouble with the law, so DJJ kids. And, and I find that in many counties in Illinois, the, the legal system does not follow the research. And I need a way to speak to that objectively with facts and evidence in order to reach the minds and then hopefully the hearts of prosecutors who are the main agents of change in any uh, particular community involving young people. Okay. And did every, did you pass it to anyone else after that, Kathy? No, I was last. Okay. Um, I wanted to give voice to really the people who are not usually heard. And um, in my present research, I found out that uh, several people told me that they, they, nobody's asked them questions. Nobody like what I was asking them or, you know, we don't get a chance to share what we know and how we feel. The person, one of the people I was talking with was a family member of someone who had been incarcerated. And um, so our conversation, I won't go too far into it because it's a part of my dissertation, but um, our part of our conversation was about, um, you know, what do, you know, what's the support that family members have? You know, where can we get help? Where can we, you know, the, the community does not accept us. And sometimes, you know, we're shunned because of something that is done by a family member. Um, and so when the, when the person was coming back uh, after returning to prison, you know, she said, I just don't speak about it anymore. You know, I don't talk about it with friends and family and, and neighbors. Um, and it just, it, she, had been, she felt like she had been silenced. Um, I'd like to, this is a discussion that that's what's happening here. So tell me about the paper. What in the paper did you find that touched you, that you found that um, surprised you that, or that you found that made you sad? I'm, I'm sending the talking piece to Barbara, or, or, or gave you hope? Mm -hmm. um, I think the understanding of the benefits of listening to, as you said, listening to people who uh, have been incarcerated, are incarcerated, and members of families and people in the communities, and the commitment to engaging 
them and providing the voices, you know, their voices in the conversation about this is something that is pivotal in your work, Muriel. Okay. And for the world. <laughs> All right, pass the talking piece. I pass it to Jennifer. Thank you, Barbara. I You're welcome talking piece and I share that I unfortunately uh, was unable to read the paper ahead of time and so okay. I will pass it along to Nalini. Okay. Uh, yeah I think I'm going to give other people chances because we've been part of this uh, uh, exercise with Muriel so I am going to give it to Mary. I was um, I learned a lot about the importance of connecting people intentionally back into the community. I really had no awareness of how important um, it is to um, intentionally plan how people will be welcomed back into the community as a process. Uh, I have been thinking uh, about how I reacted to in my younger age to be, to um, someone in prison. Oh, okay, he's, he's from prison. But I never thought that I was connected to him or could be. Uh, and so Muriel gave me a whole nother set of uh, thoughts about uh, if people are going to be, um, re, uh, are gonna be, they come again into the community then it has to be an intentional process. And I think this pandemic that we're going through is a, an absolute wonderful opportunity to see how the commitment of the community affects all of us. And I think that if people understand that, that how, how they, that is to say, people who are not just family members, but the entire community understand how important it is for everybody in the community to first of all acknowledge that this person has done he, whatever he is. I mean, he, his prison sentence, sentence is done. Now the question is, how do we welcome you back and make you feel equal and acceptable? to everybody in the community. And I think the way you speak to that person, the way you, uh, you, you just welcome them by the way you invite them into the uh, social spaces that are available in a community. I think Muriel is, has hit upon a very critical point. And I think this is an opening now. I mean, everybody is recognizing nobody can, we're all in this together, literally and figuratively. And so I think this is a very critical thing to to um to continue and i i'm very pleased to have shared this idea the, the, to read about and to be a, a part of this conversation of what can be done and how do you go forward i also like, love the fact that someone said uh, uh, kathy i think that you need you need uh, the science you need evidence of what works and what and what can work so that people can engage in the process of, 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 of buying into the idea. Okay, I don't know who I pass it to. Who do I pass it to? <laughs> Jeannie, is she there? Jeannie Miller? Yes. Okay. Jeannie, I pass um, it to you. Okay, I'd probably say there was a, a, a line in the text um, that I was most drawn to, selecting what to sustain, actually to, Selecting what to sustain, for whom, for how long, and at what cost necessitates choice, creating winners and losers, without a redistribution of decision-making power and equity in time, the quality of life and life expectancy rate will continue to decrease in poor, marginalized communities. So when you asked what made me sad, um, I just know that that is such a reality that I was struck by that, that coupled with the numbers um, at the beginning of the text those two things just made me feel really sad. Um, Were you passing the talking piece too? Jane, Woody, are you passing the talking piece too? 
I'm missing a hand. Someone call it out for me. Um, uh, who are you? Who are you? Kathy, Kathy. Kathy's hand was up. Okay. I, I don't think my hand was up. That's <laughs> 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 a yellow box went around your name for some reason. Oh, so, um, in the in the paper, there was a part that really speaks to the space I'm in right now. It's under number four, sustainability systems based approach and wicked persistent problems. It says a sustainability systems based approach to social issues is required today to address wicked persistent problems and the ability to look beyond short term events thinking, blah, 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 and being reactionary. This must shift into being truly proactive and aware of the slow gradual processes because it is now essential to do more than predict and react to an event. And then at the bottom it says, hence a paradigm shift that allows us to see the structures and interlinking systems more accurately would be beneficial and usher in innovative ideas, new insight, a new wave of individual responsibility and collective learning to address these pressing sustainability issues. And so, what I was talking about before, like we know the brain science, we know about teenagers, we, all, we always knew that something is wrong with us when we are teenagers, <laughs> and something is wrong with teenagers, but we never knew why. So we kept asking these questions, why did you do that? Why would you do that? What is wrong with you? What were you thinking when we're raising teenagers? And now we know, brains have not fully developed. But when we look at how systems react to that information, a lot of systems still continue to transfer adults to transfer children to the adult system for their crimes and their behavior. And so until we start to, and, and the coronavirus really did point up a very good point in this that I think has a parallel in the criminal legal system is that everybody knew that this virus would impact vulnerable communities more. Everybody knew that black and brown people would suffer more. And yet you could not find out who was getting sick by zip code forever until the mayor of Chicago brought it forward. And then a doctor started talking about all the reasons why African-American people and some Hispanic people are affected more, but we knew that going in. So a systems-based approach, it seems to me, would have been for those sitting down as this was coming up, thinking about what are we gonna do about the most vulnerable, vulnerable citizens? And so instead of putting the testing places in the place where people were most likely to be sick, like the south side of Chicago, the first testing place went up on the northwest side of Chicago, and they didn't even get a testing place on the south side where more people had the illness until April 3rd. Same thing in the criminal legal system. We know the reasons why young people come into systems and we don't proactively, system-wide, go out and do anything about that. We're consistently reacting to their behavior and then not following the science on that. Frustrating. Okay, who are you passing the talking piece to? Kathy, who are you passing the talking piece to? Passing the talking piece to Jennifer. Okay, I think Jennifer spoke already, or did you? Yes, Jennifer spoke. Um, uh, um, the Macklins. How about Shirley Macklin? Yes. <laughs> um, I grew up in Chicago, born in Chicago. I've lived here all of my many years. And I have seen so many changes happening. I'm recalling that as a child, I often heard people say, oh, he's, he's in jail. And it was said without any shame, you know, oh, where is your husband? Oh, he's in jail. Where's your... Then as I grew up, moved into different communities, though they were still communities um, of the black community, but a community where the um, people were well-educated, had good jobs, were stable. Never would you hear a discussion about jail or prison. 
I'm thinking uh, in this instance uh, uh, where Muriel is trying to find out what we think about our going, uh, members of the family or friends that we know who had an experience with someone who went to jail and then returned and how they were received. There are communities where you don't have that experience because nobody's going to jail. No one is discussed. You're re rearing your children to go to college and to be well employed. And so there's a great difference between how you are reared, the community in which you live. And I'm sure that I would suppose that many of you have had this experience, could talk about how the persons who lived around you were very different from the, those who lived around you at another point in your life, maybe in your youth. And that's what I'm really saying. Okay. Um, who gets the talking piece next? Uh, dear, who Cynthia? Cynthia, you spoke already. Yes. No, Cynthia didn't speak. Okay, Cynthia, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. Um, I right. didn't. I, thank you. I didn't read the uh, article, Muriel. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. I think no, somebody. I, I'm enjoying. No, I am enjoying listening to the feedback, especially from Kathy Bankhead. Yes. That's what, okay. That's what I thought. All right. So um, I'm listening. Continue on. <laughs> so who are you passing the talking piece to? I am to? passing the talking piece to Ryan. Uh, hi, everyone. I, um, I really appreciate seeing an issue like this laid out in all its pieces and seeing a group of authors getting their arms around it. So laying out all the different, you know, political, institutional, economic, social pieces of a of a problem and especially when you're kind of introducing sustainability into the into this space i just found that really fascinating and sort of satisfying to see it laid out that way um, at the same time it's depressing and demoralizing to feel the complexity of it yes. when it's not laid out that way and think all the ways in which the system works against the kinds of changes we'd like to make mm -hmm. um, and that can feel that can feel overwhelming, uh, but I think it's important to get into that and and live with it because I think the alternative is to is to uh, just uh, will away the complexity, <laughs> uh, and and that's not that's never going to be uh, workable. So I I really appreciated like seeing all that uh, happening in the paper. So thank you. Thank you. Who are you passing the talking piece to? I'm looking at all of the faces and they look like they've all had an opportunity. Mary Lennox, did you speak? Yes. Garrett, go. Uh, it, uh, sorry, oh. Garrett Adams. Garrett. Nobody. Garrett. Um, so, Garrett. yeah, um, learning about prison and how it's connected to communities and other places around the globe was really uh, powerful to me. And uh, me working with kids, the section about children with incarcerated parents, uh, um, that was really, um, that was really sad for me um, reading about that. Just the fact that um, hmm, children um, have a 25% chance of being in prison later in life if their parents are um, in prison and that just uh, stuck out to me a lot working with kids that come from low income families and stuff like that and um, before the school shut down from coronavirus hearing their stories about their mom or their dad being in prison and um, just even having that thought that there's a 25 percent more chance of them going to prison now because of their parents being in jail was really sad to me and also that leads to children being in foster homes, <laughs> moving around for pretty much like their whole lives until they're 18 years old. Um, 
that was, that really stuck out to me while reading this. Yeah. Okay. Who are you passing the talking piece to? I think, how are we doing on time? We got five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Who it's, I think Farah, did you talk? Oh, no, I haven't. Um, I think I, we can move to the next part because I, I didn't get a chance. I, I read the abstract as a graduate student also, but I did not go deeper. So okay. I just thought of how the sustainability approach gets to answer more questions that other areas hadn't. So, but yeah, we, I think we can move to the next part. Okay. Um, I was often asked about um, why this issue was a sustainability issue. And I always thought, how could it not be a sustainability issue? If everybody in this world is, you know, I felt like it was a responsibility for everybody in the world to, to, take, um, to take part in the decision-making process about how to make this world more sustainable, more livable, more safe. Um, but the decision-making process and the decision-makers do not come from poor marginalized communities. Although they are, th these communities are affected the most, the hardest, the first, you know, they're the first that are impacted by sustainability issues of, you know, dealing with climate change, floods, and tornadoes, whatever it is, the people that are going down first are the uh, people from marginalized communities, whether it's Native American, African American, Latino. It, it, it's, um, it was highlighted by the coronavirus. Um, I think it is very important that we think of how to move forward. What is the pathway forward? How do we get more people involved in the decision-making decision process? How do we get these people who are coming out of out of prison out of um, to um, to be a part of that? And so that's my what my research is going forward is talking with um, people who are coming out of prison, talking with their family members, talking with community members in a restorative justice setting, and um, finding out getting their voice. What what are they saying? How do we make them more stable, more sustainable, so that their, that their communities are more, um, there's collective action that's being, you know, the capacity for collective action and resilience is being built. If people don't talk to each other or if they're afraid to share stories about what has happened in prison, that's, that's kind of a mistake. One of the things that I learned about people, you know, even looking at the, the brochures for Unicor, which is um, part of the federal government's um, dealings with private organizations, businesses. You know, um, one thing that I learned is that there are um, call centers that are staffed by prisoners. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of a personal issue or a personal story. And the person said, yeah, you know, it, it gave me a break from being out of the, you know, out of prison. And the, the brochure that I looked at online, so, you know, you see this office with people smiling and happy, but, you know, she said the other side of it is that you have to be strip searched every night before you come back to prison. And I just thought, what? You know, so when people are talking and, and information is given, sometimes it's the information that's left out of the story. You know, the information, and that's valuable to know. And family members need to know that prisoners are going through certain things. Prisoners also need to be able to share that information. Restorative justice peace circles, I have found, are a way of that happening on, in an equitable setting. Mm -hmm. So are there any quick questions? I think we are um, two minutes. So are there any quick questions? We're gonna end this circle but are there any quick questions with them? Oops. I have, I, I, I don't have a question, but a very quick comment. Yes. Muriel, I think what everybody can walk away with is the idea that unlike research, most research, you're not just doing research, you're actually suggesting solutions through yes. this. Uh, and, and that I think is useful 
to policymakers. So it's not just what Kathy suggested, like evidence base, which is important, but also solutions. Yes. And I think that is the takeaway that uh, you actually, are. And, and these are not experiments. These have been tried and tested uh, solutions that you are taking one step further. And yeah. I think these are the two takeaways from your research that is important. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments before we? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Are there any more comments before we say goodbye? I do want to close with, if, are there any more comments? All right. In the, um, in restorative justice peace circles, the way they end, often end, is with a piece. And this is a very short poem. It's called The Uses of Not. 30 spokes meet in the hub. Where the wheel isn't is where it's useful. Hollowed out clay makes a pot. Where the pot's not is where it's useful. Cut doors and windows to make a room. Where the room isn't, there's room for you. So the profit is in what is, so the profit in what is, is in the use of what isn't. So we look and we need to think more about that, about those spaces where we can be more powerful and use our insight, um, look beyond what is just out there and, and dig deeper, ask more questions, ask, keep asking, you know, what, why, how, how can we do better? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so Amen much. to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I like that we're starting and ending with applause. Muriel, thank you so much uh, for sharing and everyone, thank you so much for participating. Um, it's been a great conversation and I, I hope to see you all again uh, in some capacity. And um, we'll be sending out information about future digital brown bags as well. But uh, thank you all so much for attending and thank you Muriel for your facilitation. It was really incredible and a great, really great uh, way to spend some time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.